just to clean house here. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep everybody on mute just for, uh, for the talk. The talk is gonna be just under 40 minutes because Zoom doesn't allow us to uh, talk for more than 40 minutes. And so today's talk is about BPH, specifically about a procedure that we do called Urolift. My name is Dr. Mark Greenstein. I'm a board certified urologist here at Advanced Urology. We are located in Sandy Springs. We have a lot of office locations like in Johns Creek, in um, Snellville, Lawrenceville, we're, and then we just open up offices elsewhere. You can go to our website, uh, advancedurology.com, so you can see. I'd like to thank Courtney, who is uh, our product rep, who is awesome at uh, promoting uh, BPH management and helping us take care of our men with prostate enlargement. And like I said, we're going to talk about uh, Eurolift tonight and give you a quick overview of what we can do for men with uh, prosthetic enlargement and their symptoms. There we go. So today's agenda, importance of prostate, what is BPH, how do I diagnose BPH, what are the treatment options, and specifically, what is the Eurolift system? So the importance of your prostate. The job of the prostate is to make children. That's it. It doesn't do anything else. It doesn't put hair on your head. It doesn't help you have intercourse. It doesn't help you uh, urinate. It actually blocks your ability to urinate, which is why we're here tonight. Its only job is to make children. It provides fluid for the semen so that the uh, sperm have nutrients to get an egg fertilized so that you can make a child. What is the prostate? It lives uh, underneath your bladder. It is a small little walnut sized organ. It is almost like a donut in the sense that you urinate through the middle of it. As you can see here on the, uh, on the diagram, maybe you can see my mouse, maybe you can't, but the bladder's up here. You pee right through the middle of it. And, and then of course, if we have intercourse, not you and I, but if you have intercourse, the fluid will come out from the prosthetic ducts, which are at the bottom of the prostate, to uh, have an ejaculation. What are some common um, symptoms, or pro not symptoms, what are some common prostate conditions? One is called prostatitis, which is very common. That is swelling or inflammation of, or inflammation of the prostate. There is prostatic enlargement, which is a genetic condition in where the prostate gets bigger over time. And then, of course, we worry about prostate cancer. Now, you can have a mishmash of all three things. I actually just did a telehealth with a gentleman from uh, North Carolina who has a history of prostate cancer, prostate enlargement, and prostatitis at the same time. So he called me to see if I have any tricks to help him out. We see a lot of guys with enlarged prostates that have touches, little touches of prostate cancer in there. And then we see guys that have very bad prostate cancer that acts like enlargement of the prostate. Prostate grows over time. So it starts to develop when we're in our late teens and in our 20s and 30s, it stays kind of indolent usually about the same size. If a man is 20 to 40 years of age and they're diagnosed with prostate, with prostate enlargement, they need a second opinion. There is, I have never met a guy with prostate enlargement that's younger than the age of 40. But when they get to their mid 40s and certainly on up, that's when the prostate starts to grow. There's actually a cellular term called apoptosis and that means program cell life and death. And what the belief is, the hypothesis of prostate growth, is that that cellular uh, degree, that cellular uh, background goes away and the prostate starts to grow and grow without having any cellular turnover. And next thing you know, you have an enlargement of your prostate. So what's the percentages? You know, it's a very common thing, 42 million men in, in the country. At the age of 50, you can see it starts with 60% are getting BPH at 70, they're up to 80%. And then when men get into their 80s, we're seeing almost all of them are having prosthetic enlargement. What is, so what exactly is prosthetic enlargement? 
It is benign growth of the gland, just like I mentioned. It's when the cells just continue to grow and there's no control factors. Normally, cells grow, cells die, cells get replaced. Just think of your skin. Your skin is constantly growing. It, it sheds in a microscopic level and new cells are constantly replacing it. Uh, in benign prostatic hyperplasia, that, that program cell life and death doesn't exist anymore and the cells continue to grow. Um, it is not cancerous, but cancer can develop within prostatic enlargement. What's the anatomy like we talked about? You have a bladder, you pee through the middle of your prostate. And so as the prostate continues to get bigger and it grows from a walnut size to then a, uh, a plum and then a plum to an orange and then an orange to a grapefruit because I've seen them that big, um, it starts to crunch down on the tube that you urinate through. When the urine starts to get backed up into the bladder, that's when you start thinking of prostatic enlargement and the symptoms. So what are the symptoms? The symptoms, we call them LUTs, lower urinary tract symptoms. Frequency, the urge to urinate, painful or difficulty urination, weak stream, in, inability to empty all your bladder, stopping and starting your flow. In other words, it starts, it stops, it starts, it stops. And um, the big symptom, as you can see in the little diagram here, is the waking at night. But I will also tell you that waking at night is not necessarily just a prostate problem. Typically in my practice, if a gentleman has um, nothing but nighttime symptoms and during the day they're perfectly fine, usually that means that they have an underlying sleep disorder and, um, and they need to be worked up for conditions like sleep apnea. So how does it affect quality of life? I actually gave a lecture on this uh, last year to uh, a, a big, large group of family doctors and internists. The big thing is the disruption of sleep. And so when we are waking at night repetitively, if it's related to prostate enlargement, Sleep deprivation is very detrimental to our health. It causes depression. It causes exhaustion. It's linked with low testosterone for men. It's, it's linked with irritability. And then we get sick from it. We actually have a condition where the heart recognizes the interrupted sleep patterns. The heart then starts making a hormone called ANP, uh, atrial natriuretic peptide. This gets released at nighttime and it causes the kidneys to manufacture more urine at night. And so if the kidneys are making more urine, more urine gets down to the bladder and you have to keep waking up and going to the bathroom. There's a lot of guys who plan where they're gonna to go to the bathroom. In other words, I'm going to Home Depot, I'll pee there, and then I'm gonna go next door to Costco and I'll pee there, and then I'm gonna hit the food store and I'll pee there, and then I'll make it, and they'll make it to their way home. And so they know where all the restrooms are. It disrupts activities. In other words, they're playing uh, golf or tennis. They got to stop and go to the restroom. They're watching a movie. They, they, you know, they're at the fun part where, uh, uh, you know, where um, Bruce Willis says something funny and all of a sudden they got to run to the bathroom and miss the good parts. What happens to the bladder? So these are some pictures of what a bladder looks like. The picture on the left is a healthy bladder, smooth. You can see the little red squiggly lines. That's the capillaries and blood vessels. Then as the bladder starts to worsen and the bladder is working hard to get the urine through the prostate and out of the body, it starts to become overmuscularized. And so picture Arnold Schwarzenegger with pec muscles and big biceps. This is what's happening to your bladder. The bladder is a muscle. And if it keeps working and working and working, the muscle gets thick, the muscle gets overworked, and then eventually you get bladder injury and the bladder becomes overmuscularized. And everyone knows about congestive heart failure. No one knows about, there's actually like a version of congestion bladder failure or congestive bladder failure. In other words, the bladder muscle gets so overworked that it becomes exhausted and the muscle fibers can't work anymore. And that's when guys stop urinating and then they get really sick. And the picture is here on the right. So how do we diagnose it? Bring into the office, we talk to you, 
We have you do symptom scores. These are uh, little forms that you can fill out. They ask you questions of like how often you go to the bathroom. Does it interrupt your day? Does it start and stop? Is it weak and things like that? And then we ask a question, how much does it bother you? Does it bother you a lot? Does it bother you a little? And then we do tests. Why? I'm a doctor. We love tests. We have you uh, urinate into a machine. It checks how fast it comes out. We do an ultrasound of your bladder afterwards. It tells me how much is left over because we should all be emptying our bladder. And if we're not, that means that um, we are doing a bad job and we got to get our bladder empty. We can do pressure study tests. Just like I said, it's all about the, the bladder physiology. We want to make sure that your bladder is healthy and we check bladder pressures. A lot of times I'll look inside the bladder. I have this little camera. You come into the office or I do it in the surgery center. We put a lot of numbing jelly down there and I have this little camera that I pass inside into the bladder and I just see what's going on in there. And that's a situation where a picture paints a thousand words. And I can know a person's history from their urination history just by looking inside with, uh, with a camera. And of course, we still do digital rectal exams to make sure that we don't have prostate cancer. We do a PSA screening to make sure there's no prostate cancer and things like that. The symptom scores, they go from, one, uh, from zero to 35. Zero to seven is mild, eight to 19 is moderate, 20 to 25 is severe, and the symptom score also for the quality of life, zero to six. Uh, let, let me just talk a little bit more about this. So it's interesting because the score is, is a validated uh, list. It's been proven time and time again in research studies. And it's always interesting when I get a gentleman that comes in, usually guys come in with their wives, and he says, I urinate perfectly fine. But on the form, they'll fill out, they got a 25 score, and the wife is nodding next to him like there's no way he's urinating well. So that's why we like the symptom scores. So what are the treatment options? A lot. There's a lot of options. One option, don't do anything. Just sit tight. Keep an eye on things. I had that conversation with a gentleman today. Just leave you alone. See how things go. Maybe eat a little bit better, lose a little bit of weight. You can try some over-the-counter um, holistic remedies like saw palmetto. Um, and we keep an eye on that person once, twice a year. Then comes medications. Why? It's America. We love medications. But medications have problems. Medications have side effects. Medications uh, are costly. And there's medications that relax the prostate, like people have heard of Flomax. There's other medications out there called alfluzacin and psilocin and terazosin. And then there's medications that shrink the prostate, medicines called finasteride and dutasteride. But they have, like I said, side effects. I'm going to talk about that for a second. So the medicines like tamsulosin and, and um, alfluzacin cause some dizziness. So I tried my hardest, my, I, I, try, I try to work very hard to avoid those medications in my elder population. Because with the, dizzy, with the drop of blood pressure and the dizziness, they can get sick from that. They can fall down. They can get hurt. There's actually a link with some of these medications with uh, uh, dementia. And, so, and that makes sense because if the medicine drops the pressure a little bit, there's less blood flow to the brain. And if there's less blood flow to the brain, the brain gets a little sick. The side effects of finasteride are a lot of sexual side effects. Some guys feel like they get libido changes, they feel tired, they feel like their genitalia gets smaller. Now these are, are very low risks, but it does happen. And we also see a lot of guys that get uh, ejaculation changes because the medicines you know, change the physiology of the prostate. So let's talk about Urolift. So Urolift is probably the most minimally invasive uh, prostate procedure that's out there. There's other ones that we can talk about. Let me, you know what, I think what we should do is let's talk about that for a second. So I'm going to give you a little history lesson. So originally from around the 1940s up until around the 1990s, the only procedure that was available was the TERP. That's the roto rooter. In other words, go in, scrape the prostate, get out all the blocking tissue from the diagrams that I showed you, and you heal up and you urinate perfectly well. And that's what urologists would do 
they would do 25 cases a week because that's all that there was. Around the 80s, the medicines called terazosin and doxazosin were invented to help with blood pressure because they drop your blood pressure, their blood pressure medications. And in a, a VA study, the Veterans Administration study, guys were coming in saying, wow, my pressure is better. And you know what? I am urinating so much better. And the pharmaceutical company said, pharmaceutical company said, let's take a look at that. And they were able to say, yeah, that's right. It relaxes the little muscles that are in our prostate so that guys urinating better. And that changed the landscape of prostate management from surgery to medical. And so all of a sudden, all these patients were on these medicines, surgeries dropped, but it was still not perfect because prostate still grew despite being on medications. Then in the 90s, early 2000s, actually I take it back, in the late 80s, early 90s, a medicine called finasteride or proscar was founded. And that medication blocks testosterone in the prostate in a conversion, and it basically takes the fuel away from the prostate to live. Prostates need testosterone to be alive. By blocking it, prostates start to shrink up. So all of a sudden, we're now on two medications to help guys urinate, and they did nicely. But we have, like I said, we have to deal with side effects. Then in around the 90s, things called microwave therapy was invented. Microwave therapy is putting a special catheter in to heat up the prostate, and by heating the prostate, it destroys the tissue, the tissue starts to slowly disintegrate and go away, and guys tried to urinate better. It was uh, lots of failure, let's just put it that way, lots of failure, lots of post-op pain, and I can say it's a very bad study. Then lasers were invented, specifically the green light laser. And the green light laser was out there to replace the terp, the scraping. And so by lasering the tissue, you're just heating the tissue so that the tissue eventually just evaporates and you're left with the channel by cutting, and it also cuts down the risk of other things, specifically bleeding, and the idea is that it can, it can enhance the post-operative phase, less irritation, quicker recovery, quicker healing pattern, things like that. Then water therapy was invented. And water therapy means that we have a device, it's called Resume, we poke a hole in the prostate through the urethra, as all these procedures are done with cameras, and we deliver steam into the prostate, and that steam desiccates the tissue. It vaporizes, not, I can't say vaporizes, it injures the tissue so that the tissue eventually disintegrates over a period of weeks and the prostate collapses open from the tissue disintegrating. At the same time, uh, Eurolift was invented. Eurolift was, is invented to put clips in the prostate, and we'll talk about that in a second. And there's other things that are out there. There's other lasers, there's other therapies, there's a, there's a twist on the terp called a button terp, all kinds of things that, to mimic the resection of the prostate, which is still the gold standard therapy, but we change things up to try to reduce risk. Anyway. All right, so Eurolift. Eurolift is where I look inside a, pro a bladder and the prostate. I deliver these clips into strategic places on the prostate, usually around 9 and 10 o'clock. Uh, if you think of the prostate as a clock, and 2 o'clock and 3 o'clock. And by doing that, it's basically pulling the prostate open. And the analogy is like pulling open drapes to look through the window. So it's not cutting anything. It's not burning anything. It's not lasering anything. It's not vaporizing anything. It's just pulling the tissue open. And by doing that, you're gonna squish the sides of the prostate. That side of the prostate will get a little bit smaller with time, and it's opening the channel to help guys urinate. It's a very small clip. It's an interesting delivery system. It's this uh, spring-loaded device that we use where we look inside, we figure out exactly where we need to go. I pull a button. The first part of the clip where you can see here the capsular tab, as they call it, gets deployed. The suture gets tugged on by the device. And then I release the suture with another click, and that releases the urethral end piece. And that's how it opens it up. It actually squeezes it on both sides. They used to have a stent for the prostate called Urolume. That came out in like the, the mid-90s, and that was 
all kinds of problems. I mean, if you had a Uralume, you basically went on and had major reconstructive surgery. And that's, I don't think that's ever, hopefully never it's gonna come back. It's never gonna come back. I have a little video to show you. Let's see. All right, that's a great little video. So here's a, uh, what I see when I look inside people's bladders. The picture on the left has um, a little lump in the bottom that's called the vera montanum. All guys have that. The vera montanum, if you were gonna be a girl when you were about 100 cells uh, big, that, would, could be, that was gonna become your uterus but you became a guy, and so it becomes this thing called vera montanum. That's basically where the sphincter muscle is, and it helps us landmark so that the sphincter muscle doesn't get injured. The tissue on the side is the prostate, and so you pee through the middle of that, and then after deploying the clips, you can see that it's like the analogy, it's opening the drapes to look through a, a window, and the tissue is moved to the side, and now I can see directly into the bladder. We've also known that just by squishing the sides with these clips, that the side tissue actually becomes smaller over, over a few months, and it actually can make the prostate a little bit smaller in some individuals, not everybody. So how do we do it? You know, we do our workup, we see what you're doing, we see how you're feeling. I usually still start some guys on some medications because it's out there, they, they do work, they do have their pluses and their minuses. A lot of times if a guy's coming to me on medications, then I'll say, okay, it's time to get off these medications if they're not urinating well. I work them up in the office, I talk about their options, and if I think they're a good option for Urolift, then, um, then we, we're ready to move forward as long as the patient is comfortable. Some patients can't have a Urolift, so people who can't get off their blood thinners people who have prostates that are way too big, okay? If a prostate is, say, less than 80 cubic centimeters, which is roughly a small orange, we can try the Urolift, but I don't think it's gonna go well for them. They may have to have the Urolift repeated. We've done that for people. Um, people who can't stop their blood thinners, that can be a little bit of an issue when we have to do invasive procedures. I've also done this procedure on men who uh, are awake. So instead of doing it under anesthesia, we can give them some sedation in the office with like some Valium. I can put a whole bunch of numbing medicine in there and then we can move forward with the procedure because the whole thing takes me about 10 minutes. So what do we do? If we do it in our surgical center, you get sedated. Uh, so an IV goes in, antibiotics go in the, in the veins, you get wheeled back to the room and you're given a little bit of twilight. It's almost like having a colonoscopy. Camera, I look inside with a camera and I see how the prostate looks. I map out where things are and I deploy the clips. In my practice, about 50% of men are gonna need a catheter. Why? I'm poking holes in the prostate and the prostate likes to bleed. And it's just one of those things. And so if I see that there's a lot of bleeding, we put a catheter in, patient goes to the recovery room, if the urine starts to clear up, then I'll take the catheter out before the patient goes home. 
But if the urine stays a little bloody, a little red, like high C or maybe like a, a pink lemonade, I'll send them home with the catheter. Overnight, it notoriously stops bleeding and we get the catheter out the next day. There's always some throbbing. Some guys will have a little, like they feel like someone's sitting on them. We give them some Motrin. Sometimes I give them a little bit stronger stuff called tramadol. And that usually goes away in a week. The patient may see a little bit of spots of blood when they urinate, specifically when they start the beginning of the stream and first thing in the morning. And almost always that goes away within the first week. The big thing is going to be some urgency to urinate because when you operate on the prostate, its neighbor, the bladder, gets upset and it, and it starts to do things like wake you up at night. You may be watching TV and you got to go all of a sudden. Those usually get better within three weeks. And if they're really a problem, we can always give medications for that. The nice thing about the, stud, about the Urolift is that we've got data for up to six years now. And I believe the data says, or the data does say, that the durability is 90%. In other words, nine out of 10 guys are doing very nicely with this procedure. And it's holding strong. And we're, we're looking forward to seeing the longer data to see how long it can go, because we wanna be able to offer this to men so that they can get off their medications, um, get off, uh, uh, other things that can uh, potentially irritate their body and just have this procedure and urinate nicely for hopefully for many years. So as life is going on, it is getting more uh, covered more and more by insurances, covered by Medicare, covered by uh, the private carriers like Aetna, Cigna, Blue Cross Blue Shield, United. But when we do this procedure, we have to do our homework. We have to make sure that the little boxes are checked so that the insurances can't deny it. So we have to put guys on medications. We have to prove that the medications aren't working or that the patient is not tolerating the medications. We have to show the insurances how big the prostate is because they wanna know this information because unfortunately the way the world works, insurances wanna deny. Fortunately for advanced urology, we're pretty skilled at navigating the system, getting people through these algorithms so that we can get their therapy that they need. And so what can you do if you have BPH or if you think you have BPH, talk to your family doctor. You can go online and do these international prostate symptom scores and, uh, and see how you stand. If you're a, a one, don't, don't bother, you know, stay at home, see how things go for a while. If you're scoring a 15 or even even a seven or higher, you know, talk to your family doctor. We're available to help you at any time. So I had everybody on mute. If anybody, I'm gonna ask people if you have questions, um, you should be able to send a chat. So if you go to like, there should be an icon for chat, you're more than welcome to text me a, a question. And, uh, and I'm more than happy to answer it. I find that if we, when we do these talks, uh, if everyone starts talking at once, it gets a little, gets a little confusing. So a couple of things that I'm gonna talk about that, that were not covered in the lecture is the sexual side effects, because that's a big deal when we do prostate surgery and for the prostate medications. One of the big problems with the prostate medications is erectile dysfunction and the loss of ejaculation. So when you have medicines that shrink the prostate, medicines that relax the prostate, one of the consequences is gonna be loss of ejaculation. And we've seen plenty of guys where they feel like their erections are not good. The nice thing about the Urolift is that, like I said, there's no energy to the prostate. There's no heating of the prostate. There's no damage to the prostate. And so we are not gonna affect the nerves. We are not gonna affect the ejaculatory ducts where the semen comes from. And so this is one of the very few procedures that are out there that is nerve sparing and uh, sexual function sparing. And so when I have a young guy that's in their 40s, 50s, or 60s, and they're still very se sexually active, the last thing we wanna do is disrupt their sex life. And so this is a great tool. If I was to do other surgeries like laser surgery, scraping of the prostate, things like that, 
I'm almost going to guarantee that that man will never ejaculate for the rest of their lives. I shouldn't disrupt their erections because the surgeries that I do are, I I don't injure the the nerves to the to the penis which live right under the prostate. And uh, but um, but this surgery does not disrupt those nerves. It does not disrupt those uh, those ducts. But like I said. Um, if I do a TERP or a laser, uh, it's a guarantee that the person will probably never ejaculate ever again. Sometimes I get lucky, they still have some ejaculation and, um, and, and they get lucky, let's put it that way. So I have one question here, is the Urolift totally accomplished from the, I think it says the urethra, if so, how does it externally stretch the prostate? So it's a procedure that's done all through the urethra the urethra is only seven cells thick. It is, it's paper. It's really nothing. When I do my laser surgery, when I do my terps and things like that, I actually burn right through the urethra. And then over time, the urethra grows back. So I'm not really ever concerned about the urethra. I can't say that it, um, I can't say that it stretches the, uh, the prostate but what it does is it just basically squishes it. So if this is a side of the prostate, let's, let's see if I can do an analogy. If this is the side of the prostate, I'll look inside, I'll poke a hole, and then I'll deploy the device. This is the urethra here, and then I'll release the device, and it's basically gonna squish the prostate towards the sides. And so by doing that, it's opening the channel. I, I think the analogy of of opening the drapes to look through the windows um, is, a, is a pretty good analogy so that people can understand that. So it's not, it's not really stenting anything. It's just kind of squishing the sides of the prostate to open up the channel. Think of it like a donut, I guess. If you have a donut, nice and soft, it's from Dunkin' Donuts or something like that, and you just start squishing the sides of the donut, it's gonna flatten out and it's gonna make the whole of the donut bigger. That's basically what the Eurolift does. So the uh, next question that came in is, if I have erectile dysfunction, will this process improve my erectile dysfunction? So if your erectile dysfunction is directly related to medications like tamsulosin, like salodicin, like finasteride, and we do this procedure and you get better, and then we can get you off your medications, yes, then there's a good chance that the erectile dysfunction will get better, and we've definitely seen that in people. If the erectile dysfunction is due to hypertension, heart disease, diabetes, low testosterone, unfortunately, it will not make it better. But one of the things that I, I'm a big advocate on is getting guys off of multiple medications. It is very common for me to see men who are on cholesterol medicine, diabetes medications, hypertension medicines. Next thing you know, they're on prostate medications, then they're on thyroid. I mean, I mean, we call it polypharmacy. And if I can do anything to get guys off of these medications, I'm gonna do it. That's the one nice thing about what I do for a living. I have procedures that I can offer you so that I can get you off of your medications. And just think of the analogy. If there was a surgical cure for diabetes, everyone would have it. Every single person would have that. The only surgical cure for diabetes is weight, lo is weight loss surgery if it's due to obesity. So that's a big surgery that's done all the time now. And the other surgery is a pancreas transplant which is seldomly done with very high risk. And so if there was a implantable thing we can do, or if there was something we can do and you know, stir up a person's pancreas, because that's where insulin is made, everyone would have that surgery and diabetes could be very curable. And so in urology, if I have these procedures to help guys urinate and I can get them off their medications, to me, that's a big win. I hope that answered your question. I am going to, hold on here. I'm gonna see if I can unmute Courtney, 
who is our, our Eurolift um, representative extraordinaire and say, uh, Courtney, is there anything else I should be covering for this talk? Um, I don't think so. I think you've done a very good job. Thank you for sharing all of the information. Um, it's, it's really created to, uh, for you all to have a good experience, right? So the, um, the adverse effects are relatively short and, um, I'll just, I'll share a quick personal story. So I've got a very good friend who is 53 and he has suffered from BPH for probably a little bit more severely over the last three or four years. And, uh, and he received a Eurolift from advanced urology. Um, his symptom score was about a 25 and it has gone down to a six. Um, and he, so I was checking in with him continuously. And, uh, and so the first couple days were a little touch and go, but, um, once he got past those first couple of days, um, he just saw rapid improvement. So he had Eurolift on a Thursday and he was only sleeping mm, two to three hours at a time. And, um, and he was able to sleep. So that, that was on a Thursday. So on Saturday night, he slept seven hours straight. Um, and so that was a huge relief for him. And, and now he's continuing to sleep through the night, not having to go as frequently and things like that. So that's just a testament to me having a personal friend um, go through this that um you know that it can really be beneficial and you're not um i don't know that you cover this but you're not burning any bridges by doing this right so if you need something further down the line it's still uh you're still able to do that right so i think that's a great point so one of the things about a Eurolift is that i can kind of take it back so we try not to look at it that way but because i'm just putting these clips in the prostate if things don't go well, if, uh, if things are not improving the way they should, I can always do another procedure. Uh, as you can tell, I like analogies. My analogy for that is like, think of a bad knee. You know, when you start getting arthritis of your knee, the joints are rubbing, you, you know, what do you do? First you do ibuprofen. Next thing you know, you're on medications like diclofenac and Celebrex and Meloxicam. And then eventually the doctor's gonna say, well, Maybe I can scope your knee and do arthroscopy and clean up the joint. So you have that. And then eventually, you know, it gets a little bit better, but then it starts to come back and the doctor says, okay, it's time for a knee replacement. But you went through the motions of, of trying to be conservative at first. Then you had the minimally invasive procedure before you have a maximally invasive procedure. Because once you do a knee replacement, you can't look back. The Eurolift, you know, our goal is to make it last as long as possible but it can be thought of as a staging uh, procedure to get someone to the next level. And so if I have a person who I think is a perfect candidate, I'll do the Eurolift, but if they're noticing that things didn't get better as much as they had hoped or, I, or as I had hoped, I can always repeat it because I can always put more clips in or we can always go on to the next level like a laser surgery or a TERP or things like that. Once I do laser surgeries and TERPs, I can't look back. The, the prostate is, is changed for forever that way. And the side effects change for forever. And so I like the Eurolift because I can always, I can always do something more. And, um, and so, so I think that's a great point, Courtney. Courtney. Um, I got two more questions in the room because I mean, we're going to have to wrap it up soon because Zoom may send me a threatening uh, notice here that we got to go. So is doxazosin a long-term treatment? So the answer is unknown. But if the person is having urinary symptoms and their prostate is open, in other words, there's no signs of blockage, but the doxazosin is helping with other factors like doxazosin can be used for pelvic discomforts and weak stream and pro we call it prostadinia, like prostate uh, annoyances or prostate pain, then we can consider it a long-term treatment. But if someone has evidence of blockage, then they're a candidate for procedures to get them off the doxazosin. And I hope that answered your question. All right, and then the, I have another question here. I have this surgery in two weeks. What is my recovery time? So like I mentioned, so we do the procedure. It takes me all of 10 minutes. You, there's a 50% chance that you're gonna wake up with a catheter. 
in the recovery room, if the urine starts to look good, we get you at, get the catheter out, we send you home. If the urine is still a little bit pink or a little bit red, we send you home with the catheter overnight. And then the next day we bring you into the office and we slip the catheter out. For the first week, there's gonna be some throbbing, there's gonna be some blood in the urine. And then for the first up to three weeks, it could go away quickly, but it could be the first three weeks or so, there's urgency to urinate. In other words, you're sitting around watching TV, reading a book, whatever it is, and all of a sudden you just gotta get up and go. And so that can happen during the daytime and, at the, and during the nighttime. And that's, like I mentioned, that's because the bladder gets irritated when the prostate has surgery done on it. And that takes its time to get better. I've seen some guys get better within three, four, five days. And I've seen some guys, it took their sweet time to get better, three, four, five weeks. Classically, by three weeks, those symptoms are done and guys are seeing improvement. And I think that's all I have. So I want to thank Courtney and Neotrack for helping us put this lecture together. And, um, and if you have any other questions, you know, you're available to reach out to the practice and, um, and we can always answer your questions by, um, by appointments or through our portal. And, uh, and I hope everybody has a good night. I'd like to give a quick shout out to um, uh, a colleague of mine that I just heard is very sick from coronavirus. And so oh, no. I really hope that um, he gets through this. And I heard he's, he's really having a hard time, but I can only wish him well. Oh, I hate to hear that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I wish everyone well. Have a good night. Stay safe.